everyone. How are you guys doing tonight? Good. I'm so excited to be here with you. I, uh, it's funny, I was telling some people, it's not very often that I get nervous, but to this day, speaking in front of people still makes me nervous. <laughs> no matter what you've seen me before, however you think that I do, it still makes me nervous to this day, but I'm really excited to be before you guys tonight because I want to share with you guys a little bit of, of what is on my heart, the things that God has been doing in my life that has been changing my heart, changing me, and progressing me and moving me forward. And uh, I'm so excited because it was about a year ago, um, I remember I was uh, asked to preach, and I was standing on this side of the of the sanctuary, and only the seats on this side were filled. And I remember that my pastor, Vlad, he said that we're moving into a new level where we're going to see both sides of our sanctuary filled. And it just is so refreshing to see that a year later, both sides of our sanctuary are filled, that people's lives are being incredibly changed. When we hear the testimonies of what God is doing in the lives of people, we hear testimonies like Luis's testimony, how God set him free from addictions to drug. My, our brother Andre over here, who has recently been sharing his testimony about how he was addicted to drugs for seven years and how God miraculously has set him free. This is only what our God can do. And, it's, and it is a result of prayer. And uh, I'm so inspired, I'm so happy, and I'm so excited for what God is doing because everything that you see today, everything that you experience is a result of prayer. You are here today because somebody was praying for you. You are here today because it is a result of somebody's prayer interceding on behalf for, of, for you, for your life, and for your benefit. And uh, tonight I want to share with you what God has been doing in my own heart in the aspect of prayer. And uh, my brother once told me that I have the gift of gab, so I can talk a lot. So if you guys don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and jump right into our scripture before I talk it away. So if you guys could open with me really quickly to uh, Luke chapter 10 and verse 38. I'm going to read to you uh, scripture tonight that's going to help get us through uh, the message today. So it's Luke chapter 10. It's between Mark and John in the Gospels. It's right in the beginning of the New Testament. So if you need a little bit of time to find it, you can search for it. I'm, I have it up here also as well, but I'm going to go ahead and read it from my Bible. In verse 38, it says this. As Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet. Can you say, at the Lord's feet? At the Lord's feet. Listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you are so worried and upset over all these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. And uh, when I read this scripture, I, I remember I, I've read it quite a few times, you know, when, in reading the Bible, and, uh, and after I've given my life to Jesus Christ almost 10 years ago now, which is exciting to say because it's been a long journey, and it's been one of ups and downs, and reading this scripture I think every single one of us, we want to say that we're Mary, that we're the ones who sit at the Lord's feet. And if you're taking notes tonight, the title of my message tonight is called At the Lord's Feet. And uh, some things about Mary and Martha is that Mary, uh, Martha, she was very distracted. When Jesus came knocking on the door, when he came knocking, he came to visit them. Martha was right away on her feet. What can I do for you, God? Let me cook you dinner. Let me do this for you. Let me clean the house. Let me make a place for you. And Jesus was sitting down, and then here comes Mary. And Mary sits at his feet. And Martha gets confused because Mary is getting all of the attention. Mary is the one who's at his feet, and he and Jesus Christ himself is with her. He's talking to her. He's consoling her. He is being with her. And Martha is over here. She's doing a ton of work. She's doing everything for Jesus. And yet she's busy. She's worried. And she's like, um, excuse me, why is my sister Mary get to sit and rest and relax while I'm over here doing all of the work? 
And Jesus confronts Mary and he says, or confronts Martha and he says, Martha, you have it all wrong. See, the issue is it's not what you can do for God that will draw the heart of God. It's sitting at his feet and being with him. One thing that we've been talking about tonight that you can see as a general theme, we've been talking about prayer, is that God is not concerned about what you can do for him. Because whatever you can do for God will never match what he can do for you. It will never, ever compare to what God can do in your life. So it's not about the work that we do, but it's about the relationship that we maintain with Jesus Christ. That's what Christianity is all about. It's not about how much we can do. Many people in religion, they work a lot. They do a lot, and they have to earn their salvation. But with Christianity, it is not, God is not concerned about what you can do for him. He's concerned about what he can do for you and being with you. And tonight I want to share with you um, a few points about being with God and the importance of prayer in our lives and seeking after his face. The things that I've learned over the last couple of months in going through ups and downs and, and good times and hard times and the things that the Holy Spirit has been working on my own heart. And tonight, the things I'm going to share with you will be brutally transparent to my own detriment. But I hope that whatever comes tonight, that it will touch your heart and hopefully inspire you to seek after God all the more because he cares for you, because he wants to be with you. He desires to have a relationship with you. He wants to have a relationship with you the way he had with Mary, where Mary sat at his feet. And he said, Martha, you're worried about all of the details, but Mary has discovered something so important, the beauty of a relationship with Jesus Christ. And uh, so last year I preached a message um, called From Danger to Destiny. It was last March. I remember it very well. It was during a time in my life where, you know, I didn't know all the things that were going to happen to me that year. And I was really excited because I really thought a whole bunch of really good things were going to happen to me. And little did I know that my world was about to take the biggest turn of its life. And through all that time, I, the message I preach, I reference Acts chapter 27, where Paul is about to enter into his destiny. He's leaving, uh, he's leaving Israel, and he's stepping into Rome, the very place where God had promised that he is going to reach to the Gentiles, that God had promised him that you're going to reach my people, and you're going to walk in this destiny. And he was so excited about it that he spent all of his time and all of his effort trying to get to Rome. And finally, he gets on a ship, and he starts sailing on the ship, boom, you would think that his life was set. You would think that he, his destiny is awaiting him and that he's going to get over there smoothly and everything's going to happen great and he's going to walk in, in power and all of this stuff. But Paul quickly came to find out that those waters were not smooth waters. It was not smooth sailing for Paul. He encountered a storm and the storm was very rough to the point where it began to wreck his ship. And yeah, there was something very particular about Paul uh, and very peculiar about Paul. While everybody else on that ship was scared, they were crying. They had no food. They had no water. They had nothing. And while everybody else was cursing God and saying, what's going to happen to us? We're all going to die here. Paul said, wait, calm down. It's okay. Because God is with us and he has promised that we will make it to the other side because the angel of the Lord has visited me. And Paul had a relationship with God. He had a relationship with the Holy Spirit that even through his storm, even through the rockiest time of his life, even through shipwreck, he said, wait, God is with me. And the first point that I want to share with you tonight is that at the Lord's feet, we find his rest and we find his peace. At the Lord's feet, we find our refuge in him. He brings us peace in the storm. So when the chaos of our life is going on, when things keep going wrong and things are going contrary to what you thought it was going to be like, when you thought that you were going to have smooth sailing and you were excited because you were crossing the bridge, you're crossing over from one place into your destiny and you thought it was going to be smooth sailing, but it turned out that you were actually facing a storm. But at the Lord's feet, a relationship with the Holy Spirit, you can have peace in the storm and you can find rest. In Psalms 23, King David talks about this kind of rest. He says that you lead me beside the still waters. You make me to lie down in green pastures. You restore my soul. 
that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. That even in the storm, you can have peace. Jesus Christ said in John 14, 27, he said, I'll read it for you right here. I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. The Bible says in Psalms 91, first one, he says, that those who dwell in the secret place of the Most High shall find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Uh, I remember a little over a year ago, um, on Sunday, we, this past Sunday on the 12th, we celebrated my grandfather's um, one year ago when he passed on to be with Jesus. And our, our family got together just to, to be with each other. And when I was there, I was reminded of something very particular that my grandfather had said to me a couple months prior to his death, uh, as we were kind of like reminiscing over some stuff. And I remember my grandpa stopping and he said, Brittany, I have a question for you. Okay, what's your question, grandpa? He goes, Brittany, where is your secret place? And I'm not gonna lie, I felt pretty good because I have this, at the time, I had this chair in my house where I'd wake up 4.45 in the morning, spend time with God, read my Bible, had it every single day, read a few chapters, spend a little bit of time in prayer. And that was my secret place, and that's where I was with God. And so I told my grandpa, well, yeah, grandpa, I have this chair. It's really comfortable. I wake up super early in the morning. I felt really proud because I was like, you know what? This is something new for me, uh, something that's changed in my life ever since I came back from Skowen in Nigeria from the first time that I went. And he was like, no, 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 Brittany, that's wrong. No, it's not, grandpa. It's not wrong. That's my secret place. He's like, Brittany, he goes, I want to tell you something really important. I want you never to forget this. He goes, the secret place is not a place. He goes, this is your secret place. Your secret place is right here. This is the place that only God can touch, where only you and God can be together. Your secret place is not a chair. For some of us, we have our time that we spend with God, maybe in our bedrooms, where we feel the presence of God. But the secret place is not a physical place. The secret place is your heart because it is our heart that experiences God. It is our heart and our spirit that is one. When the Bible talks about your spirit, it's talking about your heart. When the Bible talks about your heart, he's talking about, the Bible is talking about your spirit. They are one and the same. And the secret place is your heart. And so in Psalm 91, when it says, those who dwell in the secret place of the most high God shall find rest in the shadow of the almighty. It's not talking about a physical place. The psalmist is talking about being with God wherever you are. Jesus Christ promised us that he would never leave us nor forsake us. That he would be with us even to the ends of the earth. Wherever you go, he says, I'll be with you. One thing that Jesus said is that that when he was on this earth and he was telling his disciples, I'm going to send you someone greater. I'm going to send you an advocate. I'm going to send you my comforter. He said, because it's better for you if I go on to heaven. Because the disciples were so used to being with Jesus. You know, their only way of experiencing God was to be with Jesus. But Jesus said that I'm going to send you something even greater. Because right now you can only be with God when you're with me. But I'm going to go to heaven. I'm going to send you my Holy Spirit. And now the difference is, is that you don't have to be where I am to be with me. Wherever you are, there he will be with you. The secret place is here. At the Lord's feet, you can find rest and you can find peace. You will find peace of heart. Psalm 91 and verse 9 also says that those who make the Lord their refuge, those who make the most high their shelter. No evil will conquer you. And that brings me to my second point, which is at the Lord's feet, we conquer fear. When, I'm, when I think about the, uh, the scripture in Acts chapter 27 with Apostle Paul, and he's going through the storm, everybody else was afraid. But Paul had a supernatural peace, and he said, we're going to make it to the other side. He said, don't worry, we're going to get there. But I also think about another biblical character, and there's, uh, his name is Job. And some things have gone through my mind, and I want to share with you tonight. Um, there's a scripture in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, and it says that God will not allow you to be tempted beyond 
what you are able. We all go through seasons of life of ups and downs, trials and tribulations. And Jesus Christ said that we would. In John 16, he said, in this life you have, will have trials. You will go through tribulations. You will go through seasons of pain. You will go through seasons of hardship. But fear not because I have overcome the world. At the Lord's feet, we conquer fear. When we are with God, we can overcome and conquer every fear that stops us. Because like what Vladimir was saying tonight, and even like what Martin was saying, that fear can stop us. That if Satan, Satan cannot stop God from answering your prayer, but he can stop you from praying that prayer. And fear is one of the number one things that stops us from being with God. Fear of our situation. Fear of what we're going through. Fear that if we pray to God that he won't hear us. That we somehow are the exclusion. That when we pray to God that he's not going to listen and he's not going to answer our prayers because we've experienced rejection before. We've experienced pain before. And the pain of that was enough to stop us from praying because we're afraid that it didn't work work out for us before so it's not going to work out again so I'm just not going to pray because nothing happens but that's not true God cannot answer prayers that are not prayed God wants to know your heart he knows who you are he knows you back and forth he knows every single hair that is on your head he knows you in and out but he needs you to pray he needs you to come to him and tell him your heart you can't expect that God is going to come and just intervene on your behalf because God is a gentleman. He will force you into nothing. He will come when you call. He said, those who call upon me, I will answer them. He said, those who seek me will find me. That when you draw near unto God, that God will draw near unto you. And the best part about our God is that when you take one step towards him, he takes a thousand steps towards you. He plays a greater part. He's constantly chasing you. He's constantly nudging on your heart. But Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He will never force you into anything. At the Lord's feet, we conquer fear. Back to the scripture that I had first said in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It says that no temptation shall seize you except that which is common to man. And that God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. And a lot of people misconstrue this scripture. They say, well, God will not give me more than I can handle. He said, God will not give you more temptation than you can handle. And even then, he will help you in your weakness. He will help you to overcome that temptation. But God never said he would not give you circumstances that are more than you can handle. Things will happen to you that are more than you can handle. The storms that happen in your life, sometimes they will be more than you can handle. When Paul entered in to the bridge, crossing a bridge to his destiny, when Paul entered onto those waves, he didn't know they were going to be stormy. And he didn't know that it was going to wreck his ship completely. The Bible says that his ship was torn to pieces and everything that he ever knew was shattered and behind him. He had only one way to go, was forward. He had only one way to go because he was too far down this road. He was too far on this seat to go back. One way is forward. At the Lord's feet, with the Holy Spirit, he will help you to move forward. No temptation will seize you except that which is common to man. It is temptation that God will not allow you to have more than you can bear. But there will be situations in your life that are more than you can handle. And maybe you might say, why would God allow that to happen in my life? Why would he give me more than I can handle? Ask Job and he will tell you, God gave me more than I could handle. No one had it ever like Job had it. Job was afflicted with sickness. Job was afflicted with sores. His uh, children were struck dead. He lost all of his wealth. He was the richest man in the world. And in one instant, he became the most poorest man in the world. And his wife even turned her back against him and said, curse God and die because God left you. Job encountered more than he could handle. But Job handled his situation differently than maybe you and I would possibly do today if we face the same situation. Instead of cursing God and dying, he got down on his knees. He lifted his hands to heaven, tore his clothes, and said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. 
that he will help me. He will be with me. It doesn't matter what anybody says. It doesn't matter what kind of humiliation that he faced. It doesn't matter the storm that he was in. He knew that God would be with him. And he knew that God would help him. All throughout the book of Job, you see his friends saying, you must have done something wrong. It must be because you've sinned. It must be because of that. But the Bible says that Job was a righteous man. That he was a good man, that he loved the Lord. But Satan was like, you know what? He only loves God because he's blessed, because he has it all. He's the richest man in the world because everything works out for him. And God said, no, I, I know Job better than you do. I know him. He loves me, not because of the way I've blessed him, but he loves me because I am his God and I am his father. And so when God lifted his hand of blessing off of Job's life, Job stayed true to God because he knew that somehow, somehow God would restore to him what was taken away from him. At the Lord's feet, we can conquer fear. There are things in your life that will be so much more than you can handle, but how you handle them is up to you. God chooses what we go through, but you choose how you go through it. You choose what's going to happen in your life. You choose whether you're going to throw in the towel and when you're, whether you're going to say, I'm done, I give up. I'm not going forward. I'm going to go back to the world. I'm going to go back to my old life because you know what? At least it was comfortable there. Or like Job, you can lift your hands and surrender and say, God, you give and take away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. And in that moment, Job found peace. In that moment, he was able to conquer his greatest fears. He had nothing. He was stripped of all his wealth. He was stripped of everything. But in the end of the story, in the end of that chapter, we see that everything was restored back to Job three times more than what he had before. Everything was restored to him. And his relationship with Jesus Christ, with, with the God of all nations, was uh, taken to a new level. And he received a promotion. We know that if gold is to be gold, it must first pass through fire. If gold is to be gold, it must first pass through fire. As gold is tested by the furnace of fire, so is the human character tested by the furnace of humiliation. And we can learn this example from Job. Everything was taken from him. He was stripped of all of his glory. He was stripped of everything that he had ever known. He was stripped of it all. And humiliation shaped him and molded him. And everything was restored back to him. And he became a new person. He became, when, when his friends looked back at him after he was restored back to his former glory. And even better than he was before. They saw him as a new person. And he was set on high. In Psalm 91 verse 14, it says, Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. Because I will set him on high because he has known my name. When you know God and when you are with God, he will give you peace in the storm and he will equip you to conquer every fear because on the other side of fear is freedom. What happens when your worst fear happens to you? What happens next? What are you going to do when you're faced with your worst fear? The Bible says that where there is perfect love, there is no fear. And where can you receive that perfect love? Only with God, only in relationship with him, only at the Lord's feet. Because at his feet, he will teach you to conquer your fears. He will challenge you with things that will cause you to step out of your comfort zone and do things that you never did before. Because what God is really doing is he's looking to promote you. You can never be promoted to the next level in life unless you face challenges. When you face challenges in the university of God, you, can, you will be promoted to the next level depending on how you handle them. And some people, they fight the same fight over and over and over again. And in my life, I found that to be the case. I was fighting the same fight over and over and over again. I couldn't understand why I couldn't get to the next level. I couldn't understand why I had all these dreams of things I wanted to do. I wanted to be used by God. I wanted to do all these great things, but I never could seem to get there. I'm like, but God, I, I get up at 4.45 in the morning and I pray and I read my Bible. And it's my routine. I pray, yes, I read my Bible two chapters a day. Thank you, Jesus. I, I'm learning a lot and things are going really great. And I was experiencing a lot of good things. But in Psalms 27, 
This, David says that in his heart, he said, the Lord said to me, come and talk to me. And he said, my heart was responding, Lord, I am coming. And that scripture resonated in my heart over and over and over again. Come and talk with me. And my heart responds to you, Lord, I am coming. And I realized the Holy Spirit was saying, come and talk to me. But I wasn't saying, Lord, I am coming. Why? Because I was distracted. Because I was worried about everything else happening in my life. I was worried about all the things that were going on. I was in school more than full time. Some of you guys know my story. Double booked in school, taking 20, 22 credits at a time while I'm working full time. While I'm coming and doing all this stuff that I do at church and constantly being faced with challenges. Last year when my grandfather died, it was a really hard time for my family. And it just seemed like one thing after another after another. And then my worst fear happened. The greatest fear of my life happened to me, and my ship was completely wrecked. And I had a choice. What am I going to do? Am I going to curse God and die like everything inside of me wanted to do? Or am I going to be like Job and go against what everything inside of me wanted to do? Am I going to lift my hands and say, you know what? Blessed be the name of the Lord, anyhow. And I made a decision. I made a decision at the beginning of this year. I said, God, you're calling me. You're saying, come and talk to me. And finally, finally, almost 10 years later, I'm saying, Lord, I'm coming. And I'm going to know you more than ever before. And that's in the moment when I decided to take a next step with God. When it would be in the middle of the night. And I would wake up out of nowhere. And I would feel the Holy Spirit say, come and talk to me. And finally, I said, Lord, I'm coming. And I reached a moment in my life almost about five weeks ago. Again, like I said, I'm being very trans, brutally transparent with you guys to the point of my own detriment. But I hope that whatever I say tonight will touch your heart and inspire you a little bit more to go after the Holy Spirit. About five weeks ago, I had this point where right in the middle of the night, it was on a Saturday to a Sunday, and I had reached this point where I literally had this mental and emotional breakdown. I don't know what I'm going to do, God. What do you want from me? Why challenge after challenge after challenge? Why is this happening to me? Why me? What did I ever do to you, God? All I ever did was work for you. All I ever did was give you everything that I have, do everything that I could do for you. And he said, you got it all wrong. See, you want to be Mary, but your real name is Martha. You're so worried about the details. You're so worried about everything that's happening to you, but you forget the most important thing. So don't be mad when other people are merry and they're sitting at the Lord's feet. Don't get mad at them because they discovered the most important thing. And I want you to discover that as well. And the most important thing is to be with the Holy Spirit. It's to be with God because when you are at the Lord's feet, there you will find peace. There you will find his supernatural rest. And there you will conquer fear. Amen? And lastly, I want to bring my third point to you. At the Lord's feet, you will find purpose. When I made that decision about five weeks ago, when I had this complete emotional and mental breakdown, like I don't know what I'm going to do next, I said, God, if you get me through this, if you get me out of this mess, I promise you, I will give every last breath that I have devoted to you, holding nothing back. And from that point on, I began to dedicate even more of my time, more of my heart, more of my spirit to God, dedicating myself to coming to church every time we had morning prayer, making it that I was going to be here at 6.30 in the morning, 6.45 for me, you know, 7. But... Being here early, I live far away, okay? I have an excuse. <laughs> Being here and making the decision to go after God more than ever before. That when I take my lunch breaks, I'm not going to go and have lunch. I'm going to come and I'm going to pray. And I'm going to be here. I'm going to do what I need to do to be closer to you. And when I made that decision, something in my life changed. I found purpose. I realized that there was so much more to life that I was missing out on. There was so much more that I was missing. But in him, I found my purpose. In him, I realized that there was more than I could even understand available to me. And my heart began to change. Things in my life began to change. 
And I began to realize that when you sit at the Lord's feet, you will discover his heart. And what does his heart beat for? His heart beats for souls. His heart beats for people. Because the only thing that God is concerned about is people's hearts. Because he wants to be with you. He wants you to be like Mary and sit at his feet. He wants a relationship with you. Even if you've given your life to Jesus Christ already, he wants to be with you every single day. And if you haven't given your life to Jesus Christ, I'm telling you tonight that he wants to be with you. And that's why you're here today because somebody prayed for you because they touched the heart of God and God said, told them, go and bring them to me. Go and make disciples of all nations like he's commanded us in Matthew 28, 19. And when you're with God and you develop a relationship with him, the, relation, the reward of a relationship with God is power. And God will give you power to do the impossible. Our dreams and our vision here in church is to see people getting healed, set free, and delivered. That when people walk into this place, the sickness is no more. That people will no longer be bound by depression. They will no longer be bound by demonic spirits that are stopping them from being able to go after God. That they will no longer be bound by addiction, by drugs, by alcohol, by gambling, whatever it might be. That the chains that are holding people back, that those chains will be broken in this place. But you cannot see that kind of power operating this place if you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Because the reward for a relationship with Jesus Christ is power. And when Jesus Christ comes on the scene, everything changes from there. Everything is broken. And when I made that decision that I'm going to go after God, I'm going to de devote my life into prayer, I began to see things happening in my own life. Everything, one thing after another, for a year long, it seemed like everything that I was the most afraid of kept happening to me. And boom, I made the decision to sit at the Lord's feet, and everything changed for me at that point. I began to see tons of breakthrough at work. I had this dream that I wanted to uh, to do, like, leadership training and... and uh, grow in, in my own workplace and to uh, have this basically position in my work that didn't even exist. I never said anything. I work for my mom. I never said anything to her. I never told her about it. I never said, this is what I want to do. And last Friday, um, my mom and our other owner, they took me out to lunch and they were like, you know what? Brittany, we've seen in you something that we haven't seen in anybody else. And you have this ability to gather people together. And they were like, we want you to be our trainer. We want you to do leadership meetings. We want you to, to, to teach in our staff meetings. And we want you to be our person who goes from place to place, building teams. And little did they know that I had this dream in my heart a year ago when I took a class with my professor, Matt Kincaid, in leadership. And this dream was set in my heart, but I didn't say anything about it. But God answered my prayer. God answered the desire of my heart. The moment that I made his desires my priority, he made my desires his priority. The reward of a relationship with Jesus Christ is power. And at the Lord's feet, we find his purpose. And I want to encourage every single one of, two, of you tonight that if you don't know him, tonight is your night. That if you don't know this powerful God who promises you peace, who promises you rest, who promises to equip you in times of trouble, that you can know him tonight. Then maybe you're thinking that in your life, I have nothing going on. I have nothing to look forward to. I have nothing to do. He'll give you purpose. And that, it is important to get connected into a living church where, where God can develop this purpose in you. Exactly like what we've been talking about tonight. In developing a relationship with Jesus Christ. One that lasts. Because Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship. It's not about the work you do like Martha. But it's about the relationship you maintain like Mary. And the atmosphere produced by that relationship. What you will do for God is greater than what you can even imagine. When you're partnered with Him and you're walking with Him and you're walking with the Holy Spirit in prayer, you will even surprise yourself 